Okay, welcome back. So, uh, anyone who was in, uh, our, in uh, the previous session, um, apparently I was being name checked a little bit, but that's okay because I ripped off his entire idea last night and did a talk about that, so we're all friends. Um, before I start, um, this is all talking about old new stuff. Does anyone apart from Greg Young recognize that font? There's a hand went up. Sorry? It's not fixed, sis. It's the MS-DOS VGA font. <laughs> Proper old school. Um, it felt right. So I want to, um, I want to uh, talk to you about a number of things this afternoon. But if you're in a hurry and you need to get out of here, um, that's basically the entire talk. <laughs> okay, so, and we're done, and now we can take some questions. Um, and so this is a consultant's talk, it, two consultants, the entire thrust of this talk is it depends. Okay, but there's a bunch of things that it can depend about. So we're going to look at a number of the things that it could depend about. So we're going to look at a number of things. We're going to look at some things about development, some choices and decisions we make while we're building software. We're going to take a look at some decisions we make and some trade-offs we make in, uh, in architecture. And we're going to look at deployment and getting things into production because there's no point writing stuff unless uh, we can deploy it. I love these balloons. Balloons are great fun. Wonderful. Right, so then let's take a look at deployment. Uh, sorry, development. So what kinds of things are we trading off when we, when, we, when we do development, when we write software? So automated or manual build, which one of those is better? Who thinks an automated build is better? Uh, almost every hand went up. Who thinks a manual build is better? Paul Stack, no, <laughs> nobody, okay. <laughs> one person, one person has figured out where this is going. Okay. What are we trading off when we automate the build? What are we gaining? What do we gain when we automate a build? <laughs> it basically doesn't depend. <laughs> what, what do we mostly, in the general case, gain when we automate a build? What do we gain? Sanity. Predictability. Uh, we gain feedback from an automated build. I guess it depends how you automate it. That depends. What else do we gain? Repeatability. Said so two people simultaneously, which I think there's an irony in there somewhere. <laughs> um, okay, repeatability. Um, what else? There's some other more subtle things. We get a level of documentation. I can look at the build automation, I can look at the build script, and it tells me what things happen, which is quite nice. Um, so, so I gain quite a lot. Um, I gain speed, I probably gain time back in my day because I, as a human being I don't need to do this work. So that's kind of cool. What am I losing? Sorry? Flexibility. Flexibility. My build only does one thing, it does the thing I told it to do, it's programming. Okay, so I might lose some flexibility. What else do I lose? Sorry? Money. I lose money by automating a build. This man should not be automating builds. <laughs> okay. What, 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 else do I, what else do I lose by automating a build? Excuses to go get coffee. I lose excuses to go get coffee. This is absolutely true. I lose... In, I, I, what I lose, a lot of the time what I lose is a knowledge of that build. Okay. I lose, we end up with these big complicated builds that have more and more stuff shoved into them. And I don't know why it's there. And so eventually what happens is I add one little thing to the build and another little thing to the build, and eventually the build's taking 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. And I look at this and it just takes an hour, but I still know that if I did, I have this fear that if I did all these things manually, well, it takes a, it takes a machine an hour. It'll take me days and days, and I'll probably mess it up, right? So I lose knowledge about what's in that build. I lose flexibility. So with a manual build, here's what I do. I get to go and revisit 
all of those assumptions that are currently in the build. At the moment you automate anything, you lock it in stone. Okay, you set it. And what you're doing is you're setting, uh, Eric Evans has a lovely phrase. He says you bake in your ignorance. At the point when you automate anything, at the point when you design anything, you're baking in your ignorance. And so my automated build is what I thought was a good idea when I automated it. And it's based on the knowledge I had of the build when I automated it, which may have been great, but the world moves on. Okay? And so I think it's really healthy to every now and then delete your build. Or at least every now and then go back to from a command line and sources get something into an environment and go through all of the stages of doing that because you get to challenge it. So what you lose with an automated build is the ability to apply a human mind to a problem and ask if you still have, if the premise is still the same. Are the assumptions still the same? Is the context still the same? Has the world moved on to an extent where this build is pointless? There's an interesting phenomenon that happens, and I've only seen it once. I suspect it might happen elsewhere. But I was one of my first Java um, gigs, or oh, sorry, uh, yeah, Java gigs at, at ThoughtWorks. I was at ThoughtWorks from about 2002 to about 2009. Really good times. And early on there, probably about 2003, I was working at an insurance firm, and they wanted someone to come in as a Java guy to help them with their, with their Java app. And I went in to look at their Java app, and it was a, it was a great little app. Uh, really simple, very well, really simple by J2EE standards. It was a very vanilla J2EE thing. So it had JSPs and servlets and enterprise Java beans and whatever. But basically, it couldn't have been more of a vanilla application. You compiled it up, you had a WAR file, some beans, and you put them into an ear file and it deployed. And that was the whole story. And they were getting into all sorts of problems because it took them a uh, really, really complicated deployment. So I looked at their really, really complicated deployment, and I'm not making this up. There was a uh, a bash, bash, a uh, bash batch script, right? So a bash script that was wrapping a corn shell script that was wrapping a make file that was wrapping an ant build script, which was shelling out to a corn shell script, which was calling a make file. That's how they built their software. Okay, that's not how sane people do anything. And what that tells me that, that that's that's not that's not even archaeology. That's anthropology. I can tell you the exact sequence of events that happened. And it goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a consultant that knew Ant. And the consultant came in, and the consultant left. Next day, another consultant came in that didn't know Ant, but knew shell scripting. So they wrapped the Ant thing in a shell script, so they felt safer. Right? Repeat for make file, uh, corn shell script, bash script. So there were like seven layers of madness. And so I just removed the seven layers of madness and wrote a very small ant build that said, build me a jar, build me an air file, uh, deploy it, and suddenly they could build. Right? So the job wasn't a Java job, the job, the job was a build job. It was one of my first build monkey gigs. It was really good fun. So automated build, we can hide our ignorance in an automated build. And the more layers of indirection we have, the more ignorance is hiding. We don't know what we don't know. So we assume that, you know, of course you automate the build. Literally nearly everybody's hand went up when I said, is an automated build better? An automated build is different. Okay, an automated build gives you quite a lot, but you trade off quite a lot. And if you're not regularly challenging the premise of that build, and even seeing, oh man, I'll tell you what, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, 2005, 2006, I was working in a build team um, at ThoughtWorks, uh, it was, I think it's the best build team, it might be one of the best build teams there has ever been, let alone that I ever worked in. It was so much fun. We had Jez Humble there, we had Chris Reed there, we had Julian Simpson there at the build doctor. Um, I was leading the team, so I, I hired Jez Humble. Woohoo! I've made worse decisions than that. Um, and we were having a blast, and we, but we were having to make all this stuff up, right? We were having to kind of figure out all these things and put them together with gaffer tape. And now, you know, HashiCorp has these incredible tools and everything's written in Go and, and I've got Cloud and I've got, I don't know, Terraform. I've got just cool stuff that makes all of that so much easier. I would love to have those problems again now because they just, they just go away. So, yeah. So don't assume that the world isn't moving, as particularly in the world of build and deployment. The world is moving so quickly that the build that you had working fine a month ago is probably redundant now. Okay? So we make these assumptions. What else? Automated or manual testing? Who thinks automated testing is better? Well, we're getting a little bit more nervous now, right? So who thinks manual testing is better? 
a few hands. Oh, I don't really know how to answer the question. Okay, they serve a different purpose. What I find interesting is this. And I had a rant about this recently at a BDD event in London. Um, almost all of the agile literature about testing isn't from the lens of a tester. It's from the lens of programmers thinking about testing. So if you're a programmer thinking about testing, what you're thinking is, I wonder how much of this I can automate. Right? If you're a tester thinking about testing, you're thinking, this will be a disaster if I don't get involved. Okay? They come from very different worldviews. And so, like to a tester, the axis of automated versus manual is probably one of the least interesting. Yeah? I think about risk, I think about impact and likelihood, and I think about different stakeholders, and I think about security and compliance and availability and supportability and operations and all of those things, and you're thinking, oh, can I automate that? Right? It's, it's just we have this very one-dimensional view of the world of testing. So there's a, there's a kind of testing, you know, we used to say, or we say sort of, oh, well, you know, any, any tester who's working off a script, okay, um, we should probably automate that. But here's the thing, I run a script and the script tells me if the, if the test passes, okay? If I, have a pro, if I have a tester working their way through a script, I think of it like a, like a security guard walking around a building at night and he's like, walking around with his torch like this, and he's like, oh, oh yeah, mm hmm And they walk around and they do the same circuit every night, like this. And why are they doing that circuit? Are they doing that circuit because the carpet needs walking on? Uh, if we don't walk on the carpet, it just gets up and walks off. We've got to keep it, got to keep it walked on. No, wh why, why am I, what am I doing? What am I doing as a security person? I'm looking for unusual things, okay? I'm looking for things that aren't normally. Those balloons weren't here yesterday. I'm pretty sure those balloons are new. So how do I know if something's unusual? I know what usual looks like, okay? If I know what usual looks like, I can be primed to say unusual. Tests aren't very good at that. Tests will tell you what you expect to see because you as the programmer, with your confirmation bias and your attribution bias and all those other cognitive biases, you tell it what to see. It doesn't, a test won't say to you, hmm, you know since you changed the layout, it's all looking a bit crunched together now and it's really difficult to read. Because a test won't go, hmm, that's difficult to read. The test will go, yes, you have value 17 on line 3, then we're okay. And so automated tests will tell you stuff you already know. Manual tests might tell you things you don't know. Okay? So for instance, I might have a validation test, automated test, and it tells me that uh, a password field is, um, is invalid because it allows more than 30 characters and the limit's 30 characters. Real story, one of my favorite testers, a lady called Gitanjali, um, she, she entered a password into a password field and it was more than 30 characters and she went, hmm, how much more? Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, boom. The bug she submitted was this. If you enter more than 30,000 characters in the password field, the application crashes. <laughs> right? I want her testing my stuff. <laughs> right? She, what, what looks like to a programmer looks like a validation error, she's made it a security exploit. Okay, she's just downed my server because of a password field, right? That's testing, yeah? So what about test-driven or test-after? Who writes tests before they write code? Yeah, here we go, you're all going to test heaven, yeah? TDD heaven. Uh, who writes their tests after? Oh, let everyone else. No, you don't. I bet, like, all those hands that went up, I bet if I come and check, I reckon 30% of you actually write tests. I reckon the rest of you are going, oh, I'm in a conference, I'm going to put my hand up. <laughs> my boss might see this on the playback. Right? But that's not the only story, right? Because it could be test first. Test first is different from test driven. Test first is this, is I'm going to write all of the tests ahead of doing any of the programming. So it's like I'm going to write the whole specification as tests. Test driven is an emergent process. I write the example for the next piece of code, then I write the code, then the next example, and it's generative, it's emergent. Whereas test first is, I'm gonna write all of the tests, which essentially map out my journey, and then I'm gonna, or, or test whenever, right? A lot of people are, do you know what, actually we can get a bit obsessive about this. Yeah, we can get a little bit kind of, uh, you know, testing as gods, right? So test whenever. Test when you believe it's appropriate to do testing. Test automation. And I love, one of my favorite dynamics is when you pair uh, programmers up with testers. I think that's a really powerful model. 
because they think differently. So the program is thinking about what they're going to build, and the tester is being everybody else. The tester is being everybody who isn't there. And they're going, well, OK, from a functional correctness perspective, have we thought about this? From a security perspective, from an availability perspective, from a, and so on. They're going through all of the different stakeholders, and they're going, what would so-and-so think who isn't here? Yes, they're looking out for us, which is very good. So, OK, so I want to describe a pattern to you briefly a development pattern that I use called Spike and Stabilize. So the idea with Spike and Stabilize is this. Does anyone know, who knows what a spike is? Put your hands up if you know what a spike is. So that's about, I don't know, about 20% of you. Not as, many as, not as many as used to. It's almost fallen out of the... So it's a term from extreme programming. And the, the metaphor is this, is you've got a... I want to sort of maybe get through a lump of wood, okay? And I'm going to try and make a joint through some wood. And so what I do just initially to figure out how hard the wood is and, and how deep the wood is, I just get a spike and I slam it through, I hammer it through, and there's all splinters coming off everywhere. It's not pretty, but it's going to tell me stuff about the wood, okay? So that's a spike. So the idea with a spike is it's an experiment in code that's designed to teach me something. So what are the rules with a spike? Someone tell me. What do I have to do in a spike? I, can, I, I need to maybe check all the different layers. Yep, that's true. What else? I can hard code anything I like, right? You should be able to throw it away. I have to throw it away. The rules say you throw, you throw it away, okay? If you, and otherwise, they throw you out of the agiles, yeah? So, so that's a spike. Now, so, so the rules for writing a spike, because I'm never going to release it, they're different from the rules for writing a r real code. And so, like with production code, I have to say, well, I have enough tests, and I have test coverage, and I'm pair programming, and code reviews. Spike, do whatever you like. That sounds to me like an option. That sounds to me like a decision I made before I started doing any development. I said, this will be production code, or this will be a spike. That's a, that's a decision. So, typically, with options or decisions, what I want to do is defer that decision until I've got good information. Well, right now, I've got no code, I haven't started, and I'm about to make that decision. That seems to me like we're missing an opportunity. So what I do is this, is all of my code, I treat all of my code like a spike. Okay? So, um, so why are we doing TDD? What's the point of TDD? Quick feedback. Quick feedback. Okay. So it means that I get feedback, and yep, that's true. But now the thing is, I can sketch out code, I can spike code, probably I can spike half a dozen ideas in the time it would take me to TDD one of them, right? So TDD is going to give me a really nice design, at least localized really nice design, and a lot of confidence, and spiking is just sketching in code, yeah? So what's the opportunity cost of TDD? So opportunity cost is what are all of the other things I could be doing? Yeah, everything else I could have been doing while I were writing those tests for that code. So what I could have been doing is sketching out several different versions of this thing. So Spike and Stabilize says this. It says, write code and get it in production as quickly as you can, because that is going to give you real feedback. Okay? Now, obviously, don't be irresponsible, kids. Right? This isn't hack and slash and put it into production. There's a minimum bar for stuff, but that minimum bar is way lower than something that's going to be long-lived and robust and all of those things. Okay, so I can get something into production that I have reasonable confidence in. It doesn't need to be pretty and shiny yet. Okay, so what I'm trading off here is feedback from defects, feedback from assumptions in my tests versus feedback from real people. Okay, so TDD is a good way to get to a design that the feedback from the tests tells me is a suitable solution. What it doesn't do is tell me if anyone cares yet, because you know what, I haven't released it. I'm still TDDing it, right? Getting it in front of people tells me whether this code is going to be useful. And so what I then do is I then make a pixie promise. I promise, promise, promise that I will go back and harden the code. I will go back and make it robust. But I decide to do that based on whether anyone cares. And the code that people don't use, I instrument the code, and if no one's using it, guess what? I kill it. I delete it. Okay, and what ends up, and, and if, it's, if, it's, if, I, if it turns out people are using it, then I start writing, I, do, I go back and pay my dues, I go back and write my tests, and I go back and do my documentation. And here's a dirty secret. So luckily there's only about 800 people in this room and a camera, so shh, tell no one, okay? Um, is this, if you take code 
and you start writing tests for it, what happens is this, is we go, you know, that, that, that horrible, ugly thing that we had with the if and the while and the nested whatever, and we want to write a test for that. Well, now we're going to pull that out probably into its own method, and actually now we've done that, we probably want to put it into its own class and give it a decent name, and now we can write out. As you start making code the right shape to write tests for it, it starts looking a lot like you test drove it in the first place. You end up with small classes and small methods and good names and consistent things. I call this test-driven testing. Okay, so what we're doing is 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 it looks a lot like um, you keep on accidentally getting bullseyes. But what you're really doing is you're firing the arrow and then you're going and painting the target around it. Okay, so do you know what? Do you know that Dan? He only ever seems to write tests for the code that ends up lasting. I don't know. He's just maybe lucky. Right? Maybe he's not. Maybe he's measuring and maybe he's deciding that only the code that warrants it, only the code that is valuable, ends up becoming robust. So we have this. And we're investing code based on evidence. That's the choice we make. We say, rather than saying all code of production quality is some massive high bar, we say, get it good enough to get out there to get some feedback on it. If it's any good, then we will go back and we'll pay the piper. Now, getting this past management can be tricky. Okay? Some people get really nervous about putting, air quotes, subpar code into production. So we need to think about the risks around that. And a lot of people don't like the idea of you going back and doing tidying up when there's this big pile of features to deliver. Yeah? And so part of the way I communicate that is I say, look, it would have taken us longer to do it correctly the first time for all of the features. Okay? So what we're doing is we're, we're getting early access to a feature, but the cost of that, the payoff of that, is that we're going to have to harden it later. And so that then becomes an ongoing sort of trust relationship. There's no magic cure for this, but something to bear in mind. Okay, so let's take a look at trade-offs with architecture then. So here's a, here's a fun one. Monoliths or components, right? Microservices. Who thinks that components are better? Oh, everyone's a bit nervous now. Who thinks monoliths are better? Three hands went up. Um, here's a fun thing, right? So people talk about component architecture, I get, and uh, Greg Young came out with it this morning. I'm going to say it again now. Simon Browns has a lovely quote. Uh, actually, he has a slightly different quote I'm going to use. He says, um, if you can't build a single monolith, what makes you think you can build a whole load of tiny little monoliths? Right? <laughs> I think Simon Brown gets misquoted a lot because he has some lovely, lovely quotes about this. Um, it, it reminds me as well, there's a guy called Martin Thompson who does a lot of low latency stuff in Java. And he says, once you've learned to use one thread properly, you can have some more. <laughs> Which is one of my favorite comments about concurrency. I think that is gorgeous, right? Once you've learned to use one thread properly, you're allowed to have some more. Um, monoliths or components? Again, there's trade-offs. With a monolith, there is a single deployable item. There's a single deployable artifact. It's easy to run, it's easy to monitor, it's easy to see what's going on. As soon as I've got components, I have distributed systems. The first rule of distributed systems is don't. Um, you should hear a lot of repetition at a conference like this because there are, I would say, there's probably a limited number of really good ideas for building software, and as long as a bunch of people keep repeating them, some of them will land, right? Try not to distribute systems unless you need a distributed system. And certainly, even if you're going to build a component-based system, my advice, certainly the thing I do, start with one thing. Start with a single thing and build that single thing until it no longer fits in your head. Okay? Once it no longer fits in your head, now you're in a situation where you can start thinking, well, I need to make it into several pieces. Now, the point then is to have a story, have a vision that, of what your architecture is going to grow into. So if I know that I'm going to build a system of components, I'm already thinking about how are they going to heartbeat and how they're going to monitor and how they're going to phone home and all those kind of things. I'm already thinking about those things. And so my, my single monolith, it starts off and it goes, I've only got one heartbeat and here I am. But I already have an idea about how I'm going to grow into a distributed system. That shouldn't be a surprise. But it shouldn't be where I start either. And I've seen teams that start with like, okay, we're going to model our events, okay, we've modeled our events and, and our event sources, and now we've modeled our components, and now we've got, and they start with maybe a dozen different little pieces, and they haven't deployed anything yet. And I'm thinking, you guys are in for a world of fun, right? You have so many moving parts and so little idea of how any of this works, yeah? 
Start with a really simple, even if you're going to have multiple components, start with them in the same binary, right? Start with them in the same code. So, you know, 0MQ allows me to have a really, really simple uh, uh, message passing actor based thing, or Vertex in Java, or you know, ACA or any of these like simple messaging type things, actor-based things, they allow me to model components, but I don't necessarily need to be distributed. So think about what we're trading off with monolith versus components. I'm getting enormous, enormous amounts of complexity. So those components are better damn well be worth it. Yeah. Now the flip side of that is this: in within a single component, if I have one within a single monolith rather, if I have one rogue piece of code that has a memory leak that has the potential to take down the entire process because that's how memory leaks work, right? And so that means that you've now got this weakest link problem, which is that the entire process is at the mercy of the weakest part of that whole application. If I design something with components, I can start to reason about resilience and I can reason about scale. But until you have that problem, I promise you it's a really hard thing to reason about. Serverless is fun. Serverless doesn't mean serverless, kids. It means it's running on someone else's server. Okay? Serverless, and I love this idea of lambdas, because now, so what we used to do, we used to buy a tin, and then you know, buy a server and put it in a data center, and then we put stuff on it, and we're paying, it's called CapEx, and then we decided, well, let's rent someone else's server, so now we had virtual machines, and then we said, well, now let's rent a slice of someone else's server, so now we had containers and hypervisors, and now we're saying, well, now let's rent per function call, okay? Um, what we're forgetting is the thing that happened before we used to buy servers and put them in data centers, which is called a mainframe. And on a mainframe, the billing on a mainframe is per CPU second, okay? What we now have is the mainframe, okay? There's a wonderful quote from, I believe it's the either late 50s or early 60s, where the, the chief exec of IBM said, the world will never need more than five or six computers. Has anyone ever seen that quote? And everyone went, ha, 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 ha. There we have billions of connected devices, right, in the world. And they're connected to Amazon, Google, Azure, IBM. Oh, wait, there's probably only about five or six computers. <laughs> Maybe he was just half a century ahead of his time, right? What's old is new, yeah? We go, oh, we've got the cloud, and I'm just going, that's client server. That's a mainframe, right? And so what I have in my pocket is I have a quad-core supercomputer with more physical memory on it than the first server farm I ever ran in my 20s, and I use it as a very shiny screen to a bunch of other people's supercomputers. It's a dumb terminal. It just needs PF keys, and I feel like I'm back in Kansas, right? So yeah, so what are we trading off there? Objects or functions? Let's start the religious wars. <laughs> are objects better? Who thinks objects are better? Oh, everyone's getting a bit nervous now. Two brave hands over there. Who thinks functions are better? Okay, here's a fun fact, or a fun observation at least. The vast majority of code I've written in 25 years, and I'm going to guess the vast majority of code you guys will ever write does this. Get some data, transforms it, emits some data. And that's where all the bugs are, OK? And what's fun is this. In a functional language, the way you code that is you go get some data, transform it, emit some data. In an object-oriented language, you say, hang on a sec, uh, allocate some memory, set up a V table, call and initialize a function uh, for my, uh, for my uh, reading uh, object, which, have, of course, is an object hierarchy. So now it has to also call recursively memory allocations and set up vtables and call initializer functions all the way down until it's ready to, <gasps> okay, now I'll take the data, thanks. But I can't just process the data because now I need to allocate some memory, set up a vtable, and then uh, call initializer function for my value objects uh, recursively that are then, okay, now I can get my data into a value object. Right, so now I'm ready to, wait a minute, Transformer, new transformer, allocate some memory. You see where this is going, right? And we make this unbelievably hard for ourselves. Go object-oriented languages, yeah? Functional guys are like, get some data, transform it, emit some data, I'm off to the pub, <laughs> right? They finished hours ago. If anyone has written any closure, my experience of writing closure is this. You write, I write closure. And then I realize that there's something in the core libraries, and it goes gadunk. And I realize there's something else in the core libraries, and it goes gadunk. And I do that about seven or eight times, and I end up with like the one line that I should have written. 
Right? And that's my entire experience of writing closure again and again, is I, I find it hard to think simple enough to do functional programming. Functional programming is far, far simpler than object-oriented programming. There's less stuff. And as a career OO person, I find it incredibly hard to think that simple. Right? So we've created this enormous complexity around ourselves. There are some cases in which designing modeling with objects is a good idea. Um, and as, as Greg said this morning, Alan Kay's description of objects is little computers passing messages, okay? which is what we call microservices. Now, uh, amusingly, these little computers passing messages, we stuff that up completely. Yeah? So we think objects equals entities, and then we get all that wrong. But that's a whole other talk. Um, Synchronous or asynchronous? Which is better? Do we think synchronous is better? Four hands who work in banks, right? <laughs> <coughs> who thinks asynchronous is better? Uh, lots of several more hands. Um, again, it depends. Yeah? In most cases, though, here's the thing. I can build a synchronous, I can build an asynchronous, no, wait, let me get this right. I can build a synchronous API on top of an asynchronous API easily. Okay, the converse is not true. Right, so if I've got an asynchronous API, you call my asynchronous API, I can write a layer over that that says, right, thanks, I'm gonna block you, I'm gonna wait on for this guy to come back, there we go, now you can carry on. So that's a really easy bit of code to write. The other stuff, a bit harder. Okay, so synchronous or asynchronous? Asynchronous means that I can carry on doing other things. Okay, synchronous means that if anywhere in that pipe is blocked, all of us are blocked. Okay, this is generally poor. If you have this in a distributed context, it is absolutely dreadful, right? So, and in fact, HTTP has response codes that are designed for asynchronous uh, processing. So as well as 200 okay, you have a accepted. Accepted says, you can carry on doing what you want. Uh, I'll let you know when we're done, yeah? So, oh, okay. Threads or single event loops? Any JavaScript people? Yeah. Ask someone else what a thread is. Okay. Um, so, threads. Threads are event loops then. So what do we think? Do we think threads are better as a, pro as a concurrency programming model or single event loop, turn-based processing? Does anyone not know what I mean by an event loop? I just don't want to ask. Okay, so event loop is like this. It's, uh, so if you ever saw Heroes, the, the TV show Heroes, and there was this one hero called Hero, little Japanese guy, and he could freeze time, was his superpower. And so what would happen is, you know, the baddies were all fighting them and they'd freeze time and he'd run through all the bad guys and he'd take all the guns off them and all that and then he'd start time again, okay? That's single event loop processing. So the idea is that you can have a uh, mutable state and you know that when it's your turn, no one else is running or no one else logically is running. So you can mutate state and muck around with things and it's really easy to reason about. But the idea is then you hand the conch shell back, you say, well, I'm done and it's the next function's turn. So that's turn-based processing. Threads is where you have threads and locks and, and joins and semaphores and all kinds of crazy low-level concurrency semantics. Okay, um, is anyone in the room Doug Lee? No. Is anyone in the room Brian Getz? No. Then don't use threads, okay, because you don't understand them. Because there are only two people on the planet who do understand them and I just named them both, okay. <laughs> Um, it's no coincidence that, that, the, that all of the concurrency stuff in .NET came directly from the concurrency stuff in Java because they're very smart people. Thread your event loops or, oh, hang on a minute, because there's loads of other concurrency models. Okay, who knows the difference between actors and CSP? Shame on you. There's a room full of programmers and no one put their hands up. That is shocking. You should all have half a dozen concurrency models in your back pocket because it means that when you look at a situation, you have a number of options to choose from. And that's, you know, I mean, okay, I'm being a little bit, but this is serious. This is serious stuff. If you're even contemplating distributed computing, which most computing is now, if you're even contemplating concurrency, which you get for, unfortunately, for free with any distributed system, you absolutely need to understand uh, Tony Hoare's concurrent sequential processes, actors, threads, event loops. Very briefly, in the actor model, you name the uh, receivers, and in CSP, you name the pipes. So in other words, I connect things up with CSP, I connect things up at the beginning, I connect things up with channels, and they're passing messages along channels, and then I say go. 
Okay, so it tends to be like if I know what the shape's going to be, I use I use pipes and channels. So anyone who's using Go, um, uh, Go routines and and channels in Go, they are CSP. Actors are I don't know where the other endpoint is, but I know how to get there. So actors have names, so they have a named mailbox, and I send a message or an event to a mailbox, and it gets delivered to them. The, the infrastructure delivers it to a mailbox which is great if I have dynamic systems. So systems where I have maybe actors appearing, disappearing, being replaced, that kind of thing, then actor model is, is, is a better programming model. In general, actor model is harder to reason about because of that dynamicity. I think I just made up a word. That dynamicness. CSP is easier to reason about, um, but is, is a bit less flexible. Go learn this stuff. This is important. Nothing, everything old is new, right? Um, was this, what are we saying? The old new things. Yeah, actors and CSP are some of the oldest new things. So, another quick pattern then. Uh, um, short software half-life. So the idea of this is, this is about deleting code. Okay, so I want to be able to delete code fearlessly. The reason I want to be able to delete code is this. Most, co most of our lives are spent maintaining code. Most of the code we're maintaining is older code. Most of that code got older by accident. It got older because time passes in that direction. Okay? It got older because no one was looking. Yeah? And so I'm fine with new code because someone in the room wrote it and so we can find out what it does. I'm fine with old code that is very stable, well documented, maybe has tutorials, maybe has wiki pages, is easy to navigate, is well architected, all that stuff. What terrifies me is the thing in the middle, right? The code no one knows about. And unfortunately, that's most code. So I, I suggested uh, this term a few years ago, short, uh, the software half-life, which is how long, imagine this, how long would you have to walk away for so that when you came back, half the code you're working on has changed? Okay. Half the code you're working on has been deleted, rewritten, changed in some way that it's, that it's different from it was before. And so for many organizations, uh, in one of my classes, someone came into that class that morning, he'd been working on some code in a bank that was written in 1967. His, his idea, he reckoned that the half-life for that code was probably millennia. And he was fairly confident his grandchildren would be working on the same code base. I suspect what will happen will be there will be some COBOL AI bots that will be maintaining that code in about two generations' time. Okay, so software half-life. So try and keep the software half-life short. And the way to keep the software half-life short is to ruthlessly delete code where you can. Replace it with simpler code. And we usually we think of code as an asset and a valuable thing that we shouldn't delete. Code is a liability. All code is cost. All code is a liability. So I want to be able to delete code. I want code with a short software half-life. There was a lovely article recently about uh, the history of automated testing at Google. And there was one, it was just a throwaway comment in there. What is the half-life of Google's code? In other words, if you think of the entire Google estate, so Search, which is one of the largest C++ code bases in the world, Ads, which is one of the largest Java code bases in the world, the Gmail, all of the Google estate, right, is in one massive, it's called a monorepo, one massive repository with all of Google's code in it. How often does half of that code get changed? Every month. Every month, half the code in Google changes. Wah! <laughs> My head exploded. <laughs> like, that's insane. This is tens of thousands of people crawling all over some of the most complicated code ever written. And half of it changes every month. That is a heck of a lot of code governance and code guardianship and custodianship and automated testing and tooling and stuff to make that possible. That's insane. That of the whole article, that one statistic leapt out at me. So short software half-life then, in order to make this true, I need small separate components, okay? I need to be able to, because if I can't reason at a component level, I can't possibly think about what it means to replace code. Each component does exactly one thing, okay? It may, and this is like single responsibility, it's more that it fits in my head, okay? So it has a hard shell and a soft center, like a good chocolate. So what that means, it has a clearly defined API and the messages and the API define the protocol for that component and I can replace it with another component that does the same thing. 
A uh, lovely quote, this is, uh, I got this from Nat Price, who's one of the co-authors of Growing Object-Oriented Software. I don't believe it's his originally, but I think it's a wonderful quote. The message is the API. Or in you know, domain-driven design circles, I guess, the event is the API. So in other words, if we think about the messages or the events flowing through the system and the protocols for those events, and you know, I'm a component, and I receive this event, and I emit these events under these conditions, that entirely defines the behavior of the system. So I can entirely replace a component with another component that has the same messages through the same API under the same situations, and I'm good. And now I have an enormous amount of replaceability options. Remember, I'm trying to create options for myself. Um, and particularly what I want now is it allows me to experiment safely. Okay, so I have identified boundaries for experimentation. And that's really important, because once I've got a safe boundary for experimentation, it means I can start to reason about impact and impact analysis. And we threw impact analysis away as a practice when we started running all of our tests all of the time, which sounds great, except when it isn't, right? So, ahaha, uh -huh, yeah, evolvable architecture. Little sidebar here. So, who thinks dry is a good thing? Don't repeat yourself. Don't repeat yourself. So I did that. Right? Who thinks dry is a good thing? OK. Um, what are we trading? Quite a few hands went up there. What are we trading off? What are we trading off with dry, with don't repeat yourself? Thank you. Lots of people shouted coupling. One person shouted simplicity. OK. The trade-off with don't repeat yourself is this. I can be dry, or I can be decoupled, but I can't be both. Yeah. So what I mean by that is this, I've got two components, and they do a similar thing, and so I factor that similar thing into a library, because that's what I do, because Dry says, don't repeat yourself, refactor mercilessly, and I do that, and now suddenly these two things are coupled. I can't, they're, not, they're no longer independently deployable, independently evolvable. Yeah? So, Dry or decoupled, mm. suddenly it's no longer such an obvious trade-off. Dry is good, well, decoupled's good, I, I heard that. Right, uh, low coupling, high cohesion. I'm, I don't actually know what those words mean, but I've heard them so many times they must be true. Right? And so if I want a proper decoupled component-based architecture, I need to think about separating out components. I need to think about being okay with some duplication. Funny enough, evolution, when we talk about evolvable architecture, evolution is anything but dry. How, does, how do creatures evolve? Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, oh, mutation, copy, paste, copy, oh, look, wings, I can fly, oh, my God, right? So, we, the whole of the human race, the whole of life on Earth has been an insanely successful experiment in copying and pasting, right? People talk about Lisp being God's true language. I reckon God's true language is probably VB6, <laughs> right? Because basically it's just masses of copy and pasting and, and you look inside DNA and there's huge amounts of redundant stuff and a, and a little, you know, slash, slash, don't know what this does but leave it, right? <laughs> and, and, a, and, a, and a slash, slash works on my living entity, you know, deploy it into production, it'll be fine, right? DNA doesn't refactor. DNA doesn't go, oh look, those two things look similar. I'll pull those out and, and put them under arm. Yeah, we'll have a little arm uh, builder thing. No. The code to build an arm is in there twice, because look, there's one on each side, yeah? So, <laughs> so that's what we do. Our DNA doesn't refactor. If we're talking about evolvable architectures, then dry is, we can, again, we can get obsessive about these things. So just be aware of this. Um, here's a pattern, and this is, this is kind of um, how I think about dry. Uh, so ginger cake is the pattern, and the story it starts like this. It says... Um, and this is a story that I heard, and I, I can't find out who told me this story, and it's wonderful, but it's, it's absolutely true. So someone's, um, I think it's their, their mother-in-law, uh, is a baker. She bakes cakes. Well, she's a fantastic cook, but among other things that she cooks, she bakes cakes. And she has a box with little index cards in with recipes in. And so she has, here she, goes, she has a, this is a chocolate cake recipe. And I actually got this recipe off the internet, so do go ahead and make it and let me know if it's any good. So it actually looks quite nice. You know, it's got, got all the right things in it, and then it, so it's got here's your, here's your ingredients, and then here's your, here's your method to build a, a, ginger, uh, a chocolate cake. And anyway, so a little bit further on in the box, 
there's another card and it's got the recipe for a ginger cake in it. <laughs> like chocolate cake, but with ginger. <laughs> Does anyone here bake? Does anyone here bake cakes? A few hands went up, yeah, right? Chocolate is almost entirely unlike ginger. Right. Chocolate is hard at room temperature, it then melts, it then caramelizes, and then it burns. Ginger is gingery at room temperature and squishy and a bit sticky. When you heat it, it's still gingery and a bit sticky. You could put it in a furnace. Ginger will survive a nuclear blast. Right? Ginger and cockroaches. So that's a nice salad right there. Ginger cockroach supreme. Right? Ginger is weird, and so you can't just swap in ginger. What this recipe requires is this. It requires that you are intimate with the chocolate cake recipe. You know it really deeply. You also really understand the nature of chocolate as a cooking ingredient. You also know the same about ginger, so you know how to substitute ginger for chocolate in a recipe. There's a huge amount of information hidden in this. Okay, so ginger cake as a pattern is this. I'm sitting there pairing with someone, and uh, this is a true story, and we're going to write another web component, and it's similar to a previous web component. And so I said, oh, it's similar to this component. And he said, so it is. And, I, and so then what should happen is this. What should happen is we say, well, yes, let's take these bits out that are in common, factor them into a shared piece, and no, he didn't do that. He just went copy, paste. And I was like, that's illegal. They, they throw you out of the Agiles for that. That's, that's, that's not allowed. And then what he did was this. He just started furiously deleting it, and went, like this, just to say I had the skeleton. And then he just started, and we had something up and running in no time. And I was like, actually, that was pretty cool. <laughs> I shouldn't say this. I shouldn't feel like this. It feels dirty, but I like it. Right? <laughs> and, and, so, and so now we had this. And then what I've realized since is essentially there are two kinds of ginger cakes. Well, there's two, there's, two, there's two models of ginger cake. There's a, what I call a structural ginger cake and a behavioral ginger cake. So a structural ginger cake is where you steal the shape of something and then rip out the guts and put your new stuff in. And a behavioral ginger cake is the opposite. It's where you take some behavior from somewhere but put it in a different context. And so what I've found with these is that's okay. It's okay to have duplication. That thing where they go, oh, if you have duplication, it's going to be really bad. Well, then they say things like, well, if you have a bug in one place, you'll have a bug in the other. Yeah, who thinks that's true? We're all a bit scared of Dan now. We're not going to put our hands up anymore. So here's a real example. I said, oh, okay, we've got this, uh, this thing, and it renders some stuff on a screen. And look, if you render it in Danish, it doesn't fit on the screen because all the Danish words are different lengths and blah. And so that's a bug. And that's true because we're rendering this screen in Denmark. Um, the same code exists somewhere else that will never, ever be rendered in Denmark. Is it a bug? Is it a bug in the other place? Ooh. It's like one of those Zen koans, isn't it? If a bug occurs in some code, <laughs> it's, a, it's a proto bug. It's a potential defect, right? But it's not actually wrong. There's nothing actually wrong with it, yeah? So I had this, I was, I was decided to eat my own dog food, or ginger cake in this case, and I was building a little Python. It was a ripoff of Heroku back in the day. And so I wanted to have a little thing where I could deploy uh, ap applications into like agents and there was a, a master node that you talk to and they both had some file stuff they needed to do and I, I was about to factor out the file stuff and I went no do you know what I'm going to duplicate it and see what happens and it turned out that the agent pieces their file access had to be really fast and didn't have to be that reliable because if you know the agent dies you just start up another one right whereas on the others on the master node uh, the, the, the file access had to be very re reliable and atomic and secure, and, and it didn't matter if it was a bit slower. And so they evolved in completely different, like, different ecological niches, right? And I know, I looked at the code, and I was thinking, if I tried to write one bit of file handling stuff that had been both secure and robust and fast, I would have ended up not, not achieving either. So I let both sides evolve differently and ended up in different places. So don't be afraid to copy and paste. Oh no, don't tweet that. Dan said it's okay to copy and paste. No, it's okay to copy and paste if you designed the cake in the first place, you are intimate with that recipe. Taking something you found on Stack Overflow and shoving it in your code is not ginger cake. It's plagiarism, okay? Especially if you don't reference it with a URL. So. Okay, deployment, finally. Deployment, the trade-offs. What, what are we trading off with deployment? Let's see, if you're, let's see if you're getting the hang of it yet. 
Automated or manual deployments? Who thinks automated deployment is best? Still like a third of you put your hands up. Where's Paul Stack? <laughs> he will tell you, I hope he will tell you, right? if you don't know what your path to production looks like, you have no right automating it. Okay, so my, my, my golden rule with automation, I used to be automate all the things. I used to be, automation was my middle name, but it ended up running out of space on passports, so I changed it. Now, automation, so I was big into automation. Here's my rules for automation, or at least my guidelines for automation. Automate something when it is boring. Okay, that's it. Automate something when it's boring. Boring means this. Boring means you've done it lots of times. Okay, which means you understand it. Okay, you don't get to automate it until you understand it. You don't understand it until you've done it lots of times. Boring also means that it keeps on being the same every time. Okay, if each time you do it, it's a little bit different. There's new surprises. It's not boring yet. It's surprising. Okay, and if we try and automate something that's surprising, it will fail. Because it doesn't know how to handle surprises. It knows how to handle boring. So only bo So once something becomes boring, i.e. you've done it a load of times manually and it hasn't changed, it's a candidate, it might be worth automating. It's still not go ahead and automate it, it says it might be worth automating. Because again, opportunity cost. What are all the other things you could have been doing while you're automating that? I had a, a team I was working with once um, back at ThoughtWorks and I was working for a client and I got brought in after about, I don't know, five weeks or something. And this was a really good team. I knew them and they were very smart development, de developers. And the client was really unhappy. I was like, that's really odd. I you know, thought works really good at this stuff. Normally very happy clients. Um, and so we were a bunch of weeks in. And, and so I said, well, what, what's going on? And they said, well, they haven't done anything. I was like, I, I, I find that hard to believe, right? They're super smart guys. They haven't done anything. And so I went to meet them and spent time with them. And, and so they, what they showed me was a build production line, right? And I, I was, you know, I was the guy that wrote the, or co-wrote the build production line paper, so I'm like the build guy. So yeah, show me the, show me the build production. And they showed me this thing, and it was a thing of beauty. Oh man, it had dashboards, it was instrumented, it was automated, it had, oh, well, you, you name it. And so I asked the question, what's been through this? I said, what do you mean? Well, what have you put through this pipeline? So what have you actually delivered to the client? Oh, oh nothing yet, no, we've been building this. I was like, sorry? <laughs> because what that looks like is week one delivered nothing, week two delivered nothing, week three, week, week, four, week five, get someone in, because right? we're getting a bit cross now. Yeah? And, and they didn't realize that what the client was seeing was zero throughput, and they were going, so that's agile, is it? Hmm, I think I preferred the other thing. At least we had meetings with the other thing, right? And so, and so this happens, and so ship something, always be shipping something. Yeah. And so what I, what I would like to have started with is just manually, there's a lovely model they call a concierge model. So imagine you're going to manually kind of take these things forward. So you're going to, you're going to okay, so I'm going to take this build and I'm going, to, I'm going to shepherd it into production. Are you there? Okay, great, lovely. And that's going to get boring pretty fast. But once it gets boring, I get to automate it. Okay, so vertical or horizontal scaling? What do we think? Is horizontal scaling better? Who thinks horizontal scaling is better? Who thinks it depends? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, they solve very different purposes. Yeah? They're designed for very different purposes. If I have very high localization, if the problem I'm solving is very, very localized, having horizontal scaling is probably not going to be the most enormously useful thing. If I necessarily have state at all different parts of my architecture and some problems necessarily have state smeared all over the place, then again, horizontal scaling introduces all kinds of locality problems, stickiness problems, all that kind of nonsense. It becomes really, really hard to, to manage state and to manage routing. Um, vertical scaling, again, if I have a full stack and I've got lots and lots of those things, that can get really expensive if I have asymmetric compute needs. So if I've got like lots of memory needs and hardly any I.O. needs, and, I, and I'm getting lots and lots of those, I end up with massive wasted resources. So again, there's trade-offs in both. Managed, do I want to want managed or in-house? Cloud or on-prem, as we call it now, which is better? Which is better? Who thinks they should put all their stuff in the cloud? Right. No hands. So that means, sorry Amazon, right, no, no customers here, right? Who thinks they should have all their stuff on-prem? One bank, right? Um, <laughs> 
who thinks maybe it depends? Yay! Right? Because, again, they serve very different purposes. And I can have cloud. Cloud just means that I've commoditized my infrastructure. It doesn't mean, it doesn't necessarily say where or how or with whom. So I can commoditize my internal infrastructure. That's kind of cool. I can have my own as a service internally. I can use someone else's as a service, but then I may be so that the entire Amazon pricing model is based on burst. It's based on you shouldn't really be using them all the time. You should be bursting into them for elastic. That's why it's called elastic. All of their things start with elastic. Uh, if I want to hear DigitalOcean are great for, for just a bunch of VMs or Rackspace or someone. But we don't think like that. We go, oh, cloud, that's Amazon. Let's give Amazon some money. And, and, so, and so we don't think about where we're going to... Um, place stuff, where we're going to, where we're going to uh, deploy our applications, how we're going to deploy them. In-house, of course, gives me a lot more control over locality of data. If I have customer-sensitive data or if I have legal obligations or regulatory obligations to not have data outside of my premises or outside of my direct control, that can be a big deal. And so now we're also seeing hybrid stacks where I use some and some. Virtual or physical, which is better? Ask anyone doing low latency trading if they're okay on VMs. Right? What you want is a server that is connected, that is physically co-located at the trading exchange, and you want the cable, the wire, network cable connecting it to the exchange to be as short as possible. You pay more for racks that are physically closer to the exchange than for racks that are further away because speed of light. Right? <laughs> Because that's how high-frequency trading works. Yeah? You cannot, it, it, you'd be mad to run high-frequency trading algorithmic software on virtual infrastructure. No one does it. It's just, a, it, it'd be a crazy thing to do. But likewise, that requires a lot of detailed knowledge of how you deploy and manage on TIN, okay? Which is a, a, itself a hard problem. We've got loads of good tooling around that, but it's a hard problem. So, finally, last pattern then. Um, dancing skeleton. So this is a direct nod to Alistair Coburn. Um, so he, he talked about a walking skeleton. And a walking skeleton is like a, it's a, um, a, 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 a pattern that says this. It says, when you first start building something, build out your entire architecture, um, but very, very thin. So you can prove your architecture. Just prove that the whole thing hangs together. Sketch it out, but it's just a skeleton. It's the backbone. It's the thing you're going to build the application on. So a dancing skeleton is similar. But it says this, it says get something, anything into production, right? Get a hello world into production, but a hello world that looks like the thing you're going to build, okay? Because that tells you two things. It tells you what the path to production looks like, and for a lot of people that's always a surprise. And it also tells you how this thing acts and behaves in a production environment. And you know what? It won't be like on your machine, okay? Even if you're using Docker. I refer you to an earlier comment about networking. Right? So, you know, if you're deploying stuff, get something, anything into production, okay? It needs to be full stack. I want the whole application there, or the whole, all of the pieces you're going to use, even if they're very thin. And the point about it is it has to have an interface. It has to have an API, it has to have a REPL, it has to have a, some kind of way I can make it dance. Because if I can't make it dance, I can't see how it dances in production. So it's a dancing skeleton, like one of these sort of little rubber skeleton puppet things that does this. And so I want to see what it does, because if I do this and the arm falls off, right, that's useful, yeah? Or if I start pressing the dance button and it goes like this, which it usually does, that's useful. Or if I press the dance button and something else in production goes, oh, hang on, <laughs> what happened there, right? That, again, is a useful data point. Right, so get something, anything into production. And so your, your motive here is fire, aim, ready. Right? It's the opposite of what you'd think. Normally, we go ready, aim, fire. Ready is make sure it's done. Aim, yeah, and then fire. No, fire, get it into production, and then aim. Use the feedback from production to tell you what you need to change. And you iterate on fire, aim, fire, aim, fire, aim, fire, aim, fire, aim, fire, aim. And you get really good at that. And so that's now your iterative. It's like test-driven development, but right the way down the path. Yeah? Until eventually, you say, yep, we're going to declare victory. We're ready. We're good. So, as they say, theory is only like practice in theory. Okay, in theory, theory and practice are the same thing. In practice, not so much. So what am I trying to say? Let me, let me wrap up 
because I'm probably standing between you guys and beer. That seems to be my default position at the moment. Uh, um, when you know what you're trading off, you can make informed decisions. Every time you make a decision, you're making a trade-off. If you aren't aware that you're making a trade-off, you're still making a trade-off, but now you're making it unaware of the trade-off you're making. If you are aware, you can now understand what it is you're trading off. There are no best practices. There is no right thing to do. There are only ever a portfolio of options of things you can do and choices you can make. And as you're making those choices, be aware that you're making choices and you're saying no to other choices. When you automate something, you are choosing to lock in your ignorance at that point. When are you going to review that? If the answer is, I hadn't thought about it yet, think about it yet. Yeah? Uh, if I'm going to replace human beings with machines anywhere, okay, yes, I'm gaining efficiency and cost savings and time and reduced errors and all that good stuff, right? There's a lot on the plus side. On the negative side, what am I losing from having a human being involved in that? And how am I going to compensate for that? Or how am I comfortable carrying the cost of not compensating for that? So, with that, I say thank you. Um, we're slightly over, but I don't mind taking a question or two. People are already rushing out for beer. Oh, hey, there's someone up here. Right. Tabs or spaces? Absolutely. Well, so this is, this is interesting. Go, Go as a language, okay, ships with a tool called Go Format. Um, Go Format's an interesting thing. What it does is it, it formats your code the same as all other Go code. Um, it's designed, I am convinced that the people who designed the format for Go code designed it to upset as many people as they could. <laughs> so Go format has tabs for indentation, which is illegal in some states, okay? Um, I believe it's only just been repealed in Eastern Europe, right? But um, what it does is this, it takes the whole conversation about code formatting off the table and we can argue about better things. Now, if you ask me Vi versus Emacs, that'd be much easier, because Emacs is evil. Batman or Superman, well, that's easy. Batman's a guy in a frock, Superman's a superhero, so it's up to you, you know. Uh, what's my favorite programming language? Oh, I ain't gonna answer this. Okay, so, oh, it depends. No. Do you know what? There are two languages that I play with that I use, and actually, you know, Python I use a lot, uh, like for proper actual development, as well as for a lot of automated testing and generally for tooling. Python, I smile when I write Python. Python makes me happy to write code in. And the only other language I've found that I'm happy when I write code in it um, has been Go. Now, I haven't done enough in Go to be genuinely happy. And I've got to say this, I'm really excited about Kotlin. And I keep getting more excited about Kotlin, but I haven't had a good excuse to do stuff in Kotlin. So in terms of favorite programming languages, if I had to pin it to one, it's probably Python. Scala or Java? Well, one of them is, so Scala is interesting because it's not a language, okay? Scala is a language feature set. It's a set of interesting language features with a slow compiler, okay? <laughs> and what it means is, this is true, what it means is that you can, it's a great place to look for nerding out on, on, on computer science things like higher kinded types and generics implemented properly and uh, grammar parser combinators and, and all this kind of craziness and pattern matching and cool stuff, right? Except all of these things were written independently and most of them don't play nice with each other. So there's all sorts of, like there is a combinatorial explosion of dirty corners in Scala that are just weird, yeah? Um, I, don't, I don't understand how people write code in Scala. I know many people do. But I just, it just doesn't work for me as a language. It's too big and too unopinionated. So I will use Java 8 over Scala any day, I'm afraid. Sorry, that was too easy. If you said Clojure, now Clojure I'd like to get good at. Uh, what came first, Dan North or the flat cap? I think I, I can fairly confidently say that flat caps predate me. Um, is it depends a good enough estimate for a client? Absolutely not, right? If it's not your money and it's not your risk, you need to have an opinion and it needs to be an informed opinion. So I actually wrote an article uh, a little while back on my website on dannorth.net about what a, a process I call blink estimation. And blink estimation is me sort of recooking a 1970s estimation process called wideband Delphi estimation, nothing to do with the language. 
wide band Delphi estimation. And the idea is this, is that in a complex adaptive system, I can make macro statements, but it's very hard or it's impossible to make micro statements. So if I look at weather, I can say it's November in Vilnius, so it's unlikely to get above 15 degrees Celsius, it's unlikely to get below minus 20. Okay, so I can say that. I can also say that within the month of November, we have a 80%, uh, sorry, 90% likelihood of snow, and on any given day, and so on. I can make statements like that. I can make macro statements. It's the same with software development. I can say uh, it's going to take not less than three months to build something reasonable to meet your need, and it's unlikely to take more than seven or eight months. Okay, the reason there's a wide range there is there's a huge amount of uncertainty that we need to go and figure out and pay down. And so that's the first work we should probably do, is to go and pay down some of that uncertainty. So I can make macro level estimates, or at least I get a group of people who've, who understand the domain to make macro level estimates. When they say, can I get a story list for that? The answer is no. Okay, because I don't know yet what the work's going to be. So uh, I've just been told that I need to let you guys go. So thank you very much. <laughs>